Um, and I'm speaking of calling a meeting to order. Do you guys need to select a secretary? So just join it on there. Well, since you all are here joining us, why don't we put one of you on? Mm -hmm. ah! <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I have she's always here. No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Uh, we're meeting for the city of the Rio River Committee for people with disabilities for Wednesday, November 15th. And the first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes for October 18th. Y'all can take a look at those. And uh, are there any changes? They might not be in your pocket, guys. They look like this. They're very, very summarized for our style. I did my best. Um, and then Christine handed over a copy of her slides from last week, and that covers um, pretty much a summary of what was covered, the updates that were given. So that would be part of the meeting packet. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have comments? Um, Changes, revisions. Okay, so I can ask one more. I make a motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay, second. Thank you. Okay, move on to the second item. Any public comments? <coughs> no public comments were registered. Mr. Chair. Report from Family Support. Yay. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'm sure it's. Um, we are developing a training program for the public library divisions. Uh, this is they are opening up new developmental classes and learning experiences for families. Um, we are going to be integrating a workshop for each librarian to learn strategies and tools that include ABA strategies to work with children that might have um, um, uh, early signs or early detection of IDD. Um, so we are working with the librarians to get that training this next coming month. We're really excited. Our partners in that is ECI, Early Childhood Intervention. Uh, we uh, also are coordinating a possibility of having developmental screenings during these sessions for the children as well. So it's early intervention. So we're really excited about that. Um, we, per we provided the Learning Center workshop two weeks, two weekends ago. We had a successful turnout of 25 participants with the uh, Learning Centers. It was a pilot program run. Uh, we were able to uh, do a four-hour CEU training for them that goes towards their license for uh, their daycare centers. So they were really excited about that combination of not only learning uh, the care training, but also getting their CEUs. We're going to continue working that method of being able to draw them in with the CEUs and then implement additional uh, trainings that, include, uh, that add inclusivity into their curriculums as well as their, their strategies of working with children in their centers. Um, our program was selected out of the 12 contracts that we have in Texas. Our program was chosen, chosen by the Maternal Child and Health Division to be part of the collaborative work, working group that the state has for the HRSA Blueprint for Change. Um, a quick background, our city adopted the a master plan, all kinds of minds, that is a, 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 a replication of the Blueprint for Change. The state is absolutely loving how we are um, in year one integrating the capacity building as well as the trainings and working hand in hand with the uh, access to services and financing to services. So we, we started uh, meeting one this past week. It was very informative with uh, the state par uh, partners. Uh, we're working with other states, Idaho right now, New York and California and Florida. Uh, that is in our working group, and they're uh, really learning a lot from our state. So we're really excited about it, and I'll continue to keep everyone updated on how those calls go and what 
if uh, there's a possibility for funding and resources that we can get on our end. On the emergency preparedness side, we are currently partnering up with Animal Care Facility. Uh, our, we have future projects to integrate them for uh, service animal response uh, during Operation Border Health Preparedness, and we're looking to expand on projects to educate uh, families of those that are in our program, as well as those that could possibly get a, a, a acute condition, for example, a mental health condition or a behavioral condition, to hone in on adopting an animal and looking at the therapeutic side of it. Uh, so we're really going into education awareness first, and then we're going to see how the animal care facility can get technical assistance on our side to get the animals the training as well as the education to be able to market for families that might need a, a therapeutic animal. Uh, we currently have this uh, partnership with Texas Tech Behavioral Psychiatry uh, Physicians. We're uh, running strong on all the education. When uh, we developed this partnership, we were really excited because every month we're able to host two to three educational webinars. The upcoming one we have, and I will share it via email with our group, is on uh, sleep disorders. Uh, so that's a big topic right now, especially those that have IBD because we know that's one of the common symptoms. Um, so they're gonna be going into that education and awareness. Uh, one thing that we also saw, other than partnering up with Texas Tech, was that there was a gap of service, a, a gap of educational services for professionals. So this past week I was uh, doing some searching and thankfully we got a good response from uh, the University of Texas. Uh, the Division for Pediatric Mental Health. Uh, we are going to be collaborating with them to uh, work on bringing trainings for train the trainers here locally on different uh, mental health disorders for children uh, so that we can continue providing services in this area, which we lack, and then also provide the education, uh, continuous education through Texas Tech with our families. Uh, so it goes hand in hand in this balance because it was a balance. Um, and that is my report. Well, I think yeah. 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 How involved is ECI still or not still? I'm sorry. How involved is ECI? Very they involved. have direct contact, like, with Christine. Mm -hmm. So ECI, one of the beautifulest things that's happened during our journey with this All Kinds of Ice Master Plan is that ECI has come fully on board to collaborate with our program. Right now, we're currently working, I know Kathleen's gonna go into much detail of, of her report mm -hmm. on early intervention. Uh, we, ECI and our program have really gotten together with other partners such as SCAN to start on the basics of evaluation and being able to educate the community. Uh, but now we're in a, a, in a fourth spot to say, okay, now what, what goes on with diagnosis? How are we gonna get to the next step? We've done evaluations, we see a concern, there's low to high risk children, where does diagnosis come in? Um, so we do have a plan where we're, we're currently working um, gradually with partners at Driscoll to see about a new program they're implementing this next month. Uh, it's to get work in hand in hand with ECI because there is a gap of, of um, communication and transition services. Meaning ECI releases their children from 2.5 to three. Uh, Child Find does receive the children at age four, possibly 3.5. And that age gap is going to lead the children to transition out to possibly nothing, no navigational support or uh, assistance on uh, resources that they can hone in to be able to do at home to continue practicing those skills for the children. So we noticed that, we've caught that gap, and we're currently meeting to see how we can work on the transition being fully our program's responsibility to navigation, do the navigational support into a pediatric medicine doctor, as well as the resources and child find. Um, so we're currently working hand in hand on that, and I know Kathleen's gonna go a little bit more in detail about the research that we've got behind it. Uh, but it's really exciting to see how the research brings us more of, uh, of an emphasis on what areas we need to work on, and how ECI, our partners at like ECI and SCAN have been really supportive and saying let's get this done let's work on it and run a pilot and see where we need to expand from there thank you let's see this item on the agenda is a report on the autism surveillance program okay yes of course thank you christine for that you on to this um we finally received um, our first um preliminary data um, already from one education source 
Um, and preliminary, um, I have um, some reports on the prevalence of overall developmental disabilities and then autism specific ones. Um, so we can start with overall disabilities. Um, right now we have 53% um, um, that are eight year olds, 37% that are 16 year olds, and 9% that are four year olds. Um, so kind of what this shows is that um, the biggest age group that we're seeing in disability is eight year olds from all of those three. So that's the biggest one right now. Um, and as for um, sex um, distributions, um, 67% are males and 33 are females, which shows that um, it's more prevalent in males with disabilities so far. Um, and when it comes to autism specific, it's kind of what we were talking about right now, um, is that we're seeing 77% um, are eight year olds with autism, 23% um, are 16 year olds with autism, but we have no um, diagnosis for autism for four year olds. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where the data is showing that um, early detection and intervention are needed, um, that we can grasp those four-year-olds. Because um, that's kind of the mark of when you can already start implementing these diagnoses, um, um, evaluations already at that point. Um, so this data is already showing what Christine said, that we really do need to focus on early intervention and kind of create those partnerships, increase that awareness, um, do pilot projects in coordination with Christine um, so we can keep on doing this. Um, and when it comes to sex distribution, 92% um, of these children that have autism are males. Um, so it really does show that the under-recognition of females um, in the um, in one um, education source already. Um, so right now we're waiting for our second education source and once we have those two, I'll aggregate them to give you guys a more complete picture because right now they're preliminary so they may change. Um, but so far we are seeing um, that early intervention is something that we need to kind of improve on and um, the under recognition of autism in girls is something that we also kind of need to focus on as well. Um, and there's many things that we can focus on as well, uh, maybe meeting with clinicians, psychologists here, uh, maybe bringing other people in the field that already are well known in detecting autism in girls and we connect some people here um, locally um, to see what we can do there. Um, and apart from our data, um, for our partnerships right now, we already partnered with two education sources. Um, and as of probably an hour ago, um, we okay. already partnered um, with Driscoll already. So now we, so now we have three sources and we still have two more house sources to collaborate with. Um, we're slowly finishing up those partnerships and we'll, bring, we'll be bringing more um, solidified data right now. So this is just preliminary, but we hope to bring more soon. So, so I have a question, is there a reason why um, prevalence is not is not evident until eight years of age? Is that because we're not testing them? Yeah. Or is it because the symptoms just surface at that age? Mm -hmm. I know they surface much earlier. Yes. Okay, yeah, so. If I can add to that, uh, we, I, I think Jaime can attest to this, in the school system, uh, students are not really tested. Uh, they have a pervasive developmental disorder uh, diagnosis. so. We see the symptoms, but we don't know the classification. They're not given what the world would say a label at that time. Mm -hmm. So understanding that is a delay because by this time, when the parents start seeing it, it's a cultural thing. You know, it's like it's going to get better. It's going to get better. So they postpone. School districts can't uh, force parents to uh, assess their kids because it is it is a. Um, you can have all the theories in your mind, mm -hmm. but if parent doesn't allow you to test, mm -hmm. they're saying, oh, he just needs a little bit more specific say, So they need to go into the classroom, they need to do this. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a big delay. And Carmen, am I correct on that? So I did assessments for many years. To, to mm -hmm. add on, uh, what we're currently working on in our project is within that transition is educating the families that, uh, that it's not just a school diagnosis, but really having a pediatric developmental doctor or a doctor, a psychologist, uh, anyone in the field that can do the diagnosis, um, to have that on hand because it's going to open them up to, again, once they have the diagnosis, they're able to get treatment. Insurance comes into play, they're able to get the resources that they need, whether it be therapies, medications, and that sort. Uh, so we, do, we, we did run into uh, several uh, comments through families for, by, by PCI that the concerns were um, as families are transitioned, they're just transitioned to a school system and that's where it stops. So we need to, again, be stronger in education on medical home about not just it being the school district, but their PCP, their pediatric developmental doctor, if there's an OT involved, a PT involved, the whole realm of the support system of the child to be able to educate the families that this is their 
their um, uh, gain of, of resources as well as being able to be on top of their child's diagnosis and treatments. Uh, so that is our goal with this project, uh, again, is to create that medical home and the education of it. Um, I know sometimes when people hear it, they're like, well, I, my home is not a hospital. It's like, no, 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 that's not what it means. A medical home means really getting your support system involved and that's your doctor, your grandparents, everyone together. Um, the other um, comment was, uh, other than the, the diagnosis, uh, again, early intervention, is that we can, they can diagnose as early as 2.5 years of age. Uh, so it's really getting the families to start the process so that they're able to get that, uh, um, again, the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, here, uh, unfortunately, Laredo, yes, we are, we are an MUA, medically underserved area, um, but it's not stopping us from partnering from these children's hospitals as well as getting the uh, services of uh, developmental screenings. Uh, we do see a barrier in uh, culturally where uh, we've seen grandparents raising the children versus the, the caregiver themselves. So we, we branched out to have ideas of saying, you know what, now we need to also integrate grandparents into the education because we, we just request parents, right? Uh, so that's a big factor too is educating the entire family. Um, and then working on, again, uh, connecting them with those resources and uh, specialty care. Uh, so we, we're, we're currently working on it. It's in its infancy stages of being mm -hmm. able to first look at the data and then being able to connect and collaborate with these uh, outside stakeholders. We haven't yet heard a no. It's been very supportive. With, we know we understand, but we also have to respect they have their areas, right? So we know uh, there was a, a given um, timeline of maybe 1.5 years of being able just to get a diagnosis out of Laredo. Uh, but now we do have someone locally here. Um, I, think, I believe it's Daniel Garza that goes to Gateway, but we're currently working, work, working with them on their status to be able to continue working with them here locally. Um, there's, again, there's different ideas that are branching out to be able to help providers from their burnout. Um, it's, uh, we know the burnout is real for providers, so we're just trying to think of every avenue to help them through evaluations through other paraprofessionals so that we can assist them through the diagnosis process. Uh, we know that pediatricians, physicians can't sit with the child and the family for uh, more than an hour to do an evaluation. So what we're doing is we just, uh, this past month, we got uh, 18 individuals uh, from ECI as well as SCAN to be certified, uh, to get the training, to get uh, familiar with the NCHAT, which is one of the avenues of being able to assess a child who has autism. Could have autism, low to high risk. Um, so now that we have that in hand and the evaluation in hand, the provider will be able to have that. Um, again, there's that uh, uh, gap. Uh, no, there's a barrier when it, even it comes to be, when it becomes literacy. Um, we know families when they receive this packet, the M chat is not something with one page. It's 50 pages, almost 200 questions, 165 questions. And I, I, I from personal experience, taking the M chat was very challenged to ask myself, how do I answer this question? Or well, what does it mean? Right. So uh, this. Development Center to get the training on MCHAT so that we can uh, uh, have that on site during our developmental screening and beyond projects so that the families are not alone answering these questions and they'll have that one on one from physicians. I have a question. Data regarding um, child care, daycare, are we grabbing those numbers? Yeah, that's what that's I was going to go more in depth right now. Uh -huh. We just kind of have the counts of people with these exceptionality codes okay. and any ICD codes in the <clears> records. <throat> Mm -hmm. um, but from those, we're going to go into each one individually and grab all the information. What they really diagnosed, how many times were they mm -hmm. seen. So we're going to grab very specific information so we can see like, okay, when are they diagnosing these children? Is that the issue? Is it because they get lost when they're transitioning? Mm -hmm. We're going to get those answers to it soon. Um, so we do have abstractors in our team that are going to go and see every single sheet that's on there, every single form that's on there, yes. personally and grab all that information. Yeah. So that we can paint a picture of what's happening individually, not just kind of the numbers, right, right. but also what's right. happening underneath. Exactly. That's and good. Thank you. Know, right. Just yes. currently came out with a plan, um, and they've uh, been marketing it, saying, are you an ECI baby? Did you graduate from ECI? Do you see signs? 
And that just clicked on me. I said, oh my gosh, so they're trying to target families that have graduated. Why haven't they connected with ECI to have a smoother transition? So I, I don't know where that gap of communication was. Mm -hmm. That's where we jumped in. Mm -hmm. And we said, we'll be that communication. So that's what we're currently doing here at ECI. We're connecting with them so that we could be that transition to help them to get to Driscoll or any other partner outside stakeholder that provides the service. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we're currently working on. Yeah, because there's such a need yeah. there, especially. Yeah. Well, the, I think the, the Autism Coalition all began because of that one lady mm -hmm. that went to council mm -hmm. that did not have the proper care for her child mm -hmm. who was diagnosed with <laughs> autism, mm -hmm. right? So um, we've got to be looking at that to assure mm -hmm. that, right? Well, we, uh, with the approval of our health administration team, we are able now to give the CEUs to the uh, learning centers. Prior to our, our workshops, we did not have the CEUs, and they, they were still successful. 75 per, uh, per workshop were showing up, uh, but now we're getting them as the entire learning centers mm -hmm. are showing up. Um, so the new, the new, the new difference, I guess it's like contributing, the, the difference, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> difference, but uh, the improvement of it now is that uh, any workshop that we provide that's part of the state curriculum for their license, um, we're able now to create those CEUs from which they come running. Because before, if it was free, that's great. But now you're adding CEUs that can go towards our license, that's 100% sure. better. Yeah. So that's how we've worked it out and improved on that area. And we're really excited that we, we piloted this October, which it, again, it sold out within the first 10 minutes of putting it out there. So we're really excited for the upcoming ones. The upcoming ones are going to include, of course, BCI. We're looking at stakeholders from uh, the Kiki Strategies, BCBAs. We're also looking to incorporate emergency preparedness, um, as well as uh, prevention, uh, disease prevention. So uh, there's a lot of topics that we're going to be um, including that can focus on the child development side and also the children with special health care needs. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back another bit, maybe some clarification, the transition between ECI and the school. On the child side, a child must be referred 90 days before from ECI before he turns three, because the school's responsibility is that child must be at school by, the, by his child's third birthday. Mm -hmm. So we have 90 days. I think there is where there should not be a transition, but I was a diet actually this happen. <laughs> but, you know. We can play things back and forth, you know, but that is the law that I find. Yeah. Yeah. The child's third birthday should be yes. already provided services and, by the school. Oh. And with that, my goal in our program was, uh, again, meeting with ECI, it was very supportive. We agree. Let's let you be the, the communication between that barrier, the 90 days, so that we can help each other. That's so, great. Yes. It's, it, it, they're overworked. I mean, I work very well with ECI. I mean, it's, yes. it's hard. Good work. It hardened my ignorance, but I just had a kind of a question or a thought in terms of um, gaps in services for transportation for families locally. What are we seeing in that regard? We do have a program here locally within our metro system. It's called the L Circulator. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it grants families from zero to uh, their lifespan to be able to register and get provide a membership so they could be um, given the transportation to anything they might need that's uh, daily living. Um, doctor's appointments, including in services surgery. such as this. And I'm just thinking about service area and reach for that too in terms of accessibility for any of those that might need any kind of wheelchair accommodation. So the L circulators do accommodate um, wheelchairs, physical disabilities, all the way to um, cognitive and um, IV. So uh, we had a meeting with uh, our metro, our, our metro director came by and he was giving us some more insights about how their services run, and they do talk about uh, certain certain areas they cannot reach. I'm just not familiar to which ones, mm -hmm. uh, but they do service all our districts. Um, That's a great question mm -hmm. because yeah. I mean, so such a need. Does that cover the well? The metro covers the health aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. For their daily living, I know. I, I believe it was one of the residents that you service, correct? That yeah. was having difficulty on an outside yes. area. They lost their job or something, right? Um, yes, it was uh, the time frame uh, because she was using it for employment. Yes. She was leaving blind. She was using it for that, and she couldn't. It, it, it was get there on time or something. Oh. Yeah, I call that. So they are based on a, uh, they have a schedule um, that they go off, and it, it's a first, it is a first come first serve. 
um, but they're looking to they re, they had mentioned that they received some money to expand on vehicles, so that was a, a hopeful mm -hmm. um, conversation again to be able to service the amount of capacity that they were building through that throughout the year. Yeah. Um, the yeah. other um, the other uh, plus of when they had came and visit, um, they were teaching us a little bit more about their services and what they can and cannot do inside the bus or things. Yeah. Um, one of our other committee members, Ms. Ogunio, who's not here with us today. Um, uh, she was mentioning um, individuals with IDD. We know when buses are loud, you know, things like that, is there sensory tactile material? So that was an open conversation for them to really uh, better understand the IDD community. And our program is working with them to have kids in their vehicles to have that are sensory tactile material to avoid any triggers or outbursts, you know, things like that, that can assist them to have them in a calming manner. Mm -hmm. um, so we do work hand in hand. There was a policy concern, I believe, also on the on the, med, uh, the yes. circulator, mm -hmm. but they're going to be looking into it to see how they can change. So we're really happy that in a systematic level, there could be changes um, mm -hmm. in, in that area. Thank you. Last one, last one that we spoke regarding the diagnosing of individuals with autism. Uh, I mentioned that there was a company, they're from, they're from further north, but they're in San Antonio. I want to say they're called Fiber Dynamics. Okay. I don't remember. Uh, but I can mention the name. But what they do is they develop a saliva test where they're able to um, identify whether that individual, whether that child is likely or has a, is proponent to possibly having autism as they develop. This is far beyond the, before they even start displaying any type of behaviors, okay? So it's a, it's a really advanced organization company that does, works with biometrics and, the, and, and things at the molecular level, okay? And so, um, their, their issue is they're trying to help the providers mm -hmm. who in many instances the, pedi the pediatricians don't have the staff or the knowledge mm -hmm. to make that determination. Mm -hmm. It also resolves a lot of issues about lack of resources or enough, re enough mm -hmm. individuals or, or the capacity. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you a heads up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just I'm just asking whether you all had ever heard of them. Yeah, because I I haven't heard of them, but we can definitely reach out to them. Um, what, now that we have all of this, we can kind of show them that and maybe see if there's something they can. I'll send you their precise them. name. I tried to come up, but I can't find them. But I've I've read quite a bit about them because they have besides autism, they have other tests that they they've, they've developed. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and so uh, the best is sure. with us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to, of course, it's it's a money maker for them, <laughs> but they're trying to infiltrate the, the, the private sector, the public sector, the school systems. It doesn't mean that they're going to like take over what a professional would do, but at least it gives you a heads up that there is potentially there's a child here that is that has that is showing signs or indicators that they may have uh, developed autism in the future within the next years. And so they're, they're trying to cut down the time that it takes. Okay, I think it's like, you, I think most professionals can't determine that until the age of, what, three? Yes. And so they, they, they figure that they can start identifying those factors <clears throat> by the age of 12 months to 18 months or something like that. So they can start developing what the treatment is necessary to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I don't know the name of the company. I want to say it's Quadra Dynamics or something like that. Yeah, I'm trying to that. I'll send it to you. Okay. It would actually be great to potentially include that as an agenda item so we get the experts in the room speaking about it versus us providing that information as a regurgitated form of what we heard. Mm -hmm. So that way we're all on the same page for us to be able to give that back out to the community because if that is a service that can be maximized by the community, okay. it's definitely looking, worth looking into on behalf of the Blue Ribbon Committee. This is yeah. very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, 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 they're um, I think they're from Boston originally, but they have several offices in San Antonio. And so um, I thought it was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the name as soon as I can find it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 
Okay, so the next item we have Dr. Chamberlain, by the way, welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you for yes. And I'd like to welcome Sarah Patton. Hello. I'm Sarah Patton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're with the Multi Assistance Center with Morgan's um, as part of Morgan's Lovely Land based in San Antonio. Um, I'm the Community Engagement Manager and I have my colleague Kelly with me. Hi, I'm Kelly hey. Tinoco. I'm the Clinic Operations Director for uh, Morgan's Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm not sure how familiar we are with Morgan's Thunderland or kind of what we're doing up there, but um, thank you, first off, for having us. We're really excited to be here with you all this um, morning, afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's morning. It's still morning. Still morning yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're really excited. Uh, I did just want to, I appreciate Christine for coordinating this with us. Yes. Um, just steal a few moments of your time to talk a little bit about what we're doing and um, how, you know, a lot of our work, it seems, aligned in, in our so um, we were really um, founded, the idea started about five years ago with the MAC, but we've opened, I've been open now for about a year, and we're really focused on streamlining, coordinating that access to care for people with uh, disabilities or special needs or any kind of mental health condition. Um, we are a state-funded program um, through HHSC, and what we have at our uh, department uh, at the MAC is a team of about 51 in our navigation program, and those navigators, as we refer to them, um, really help do that, navigate these resources for our community. Um, in order to be eligible for navigation service, you can have any kind of um, intellectual, developmental, physical, or cognitive uh, condition, uh, be any age residing in the state of Texas. That's really the main requirement. Um, and what we do is we have a number of MAC partners, we call them MACers, we're all about our themes. Um, yeah. <laughs> the MACers um, really help support in that coordination of care. So we have kind of different anchors that we focus in on, whether it's a medical provider, a therapy service, or social service that they need connecting to. Um, we have a really um, beautiful building up in San Antonio, about 165,000 square feet there, um, where we ho house over 30 partners. Um, but we are learning quickly, you know, that, that those resources need to be expanded um, in order to serve the, the <coughs> populations that we're trying to. So um, we've made great strides, um, you know, with that. Oh, in our first year, we've onboarded over 3,200 MAC members and been able to support them in getting that coordinated care. But what we're here to help demonstrate is that coordination of care and the outcomes that we can help improve through that by making sure that, you know, we aren't just sending referrals out for families and saying, hey, I hope the dentist goes great. You know? <laughs> you know, it's really about follow-up and making sure that that care is getting uh, seen and followed through on. Um, but really, um, kind of two parts of that, the navigation team and then the software that we designed, that's specific to the Mac itself. We have a kind of custom, kind of mirrors an uh, like EHR, EMR system, um, but it's a little bit more social service friendly. So all of our referrals and that member care and data is tracked throughout that system. So you'll see Sarah Patton's file with all my diagnosis reports, uh, uh, notes are made, managed in that and then sent out to all of our Mac partners. So now all of the providers whether they're medical therapy or social service or connecting um, on that same platform to now manage that care through it. Um, so it's really, again, all of the providers are talking and on the same page in terms of that progress for the member themselves. Um, I'm trying to think what else I may have missed. We hold a lot of care coordination meetings for our members too. Um, so, you know, dentists may be having one issue with a member, um, primary care maybe, and, and some of our navigators. So we'll get everybody in a room, we'll sit down, we'll really have discussions around those members, to see how best we can support um, our members. So um, like Sarah said, we have over 30 partners in our building. Um, in our building, we do have a medical floor with um, primary care, which does both PD and adult um, primary care. They do GYN care, they have a lab, um, and they do some counseling services for us. Um, we have an eye doctor, optometrist, and ophthalmologist on site. Um, we have audiology <coughs> on site um, and dental. We, um, we have PTOT speech um, through a couple of different partners. Um, and we, uh, what am I forgetting? ABA therapy on site, and um, we have a neurology on site as well. So, um, really, that you know, that full coordination of care, trying to you know connect as many services in our building as possible. But like Sarah said, you know. Um, our partners can only take so many people before they're at capacity and when you have 50 navigators who are making referrals to you know one one ABA therapist who can only take you know um, you know 
25 members um, with your autism numbers, which I actually pulled our end of year numbers. They, they um, a little bit different, but very similar. And ours are all MAC. So um, we see about 44% autism at the MAC. Um, and um, we're about 61% male and 61% um, under 17 or 17 and under. So um, that's any diagnosis, but autism specifically is 44%. Um, and that's just kind of our our general numbers over the last year, but I, I think they kind of align. If we drilled it down just to autism, I think they really align with what you're seeing already. Um, and I can go back and look at those um, and connect with you if you are just curious to, to what we've seen in our population over the last, you know, over the last year. Um, but, you know, it, it really is a coordination of care and, um, so a couple of things that we have coming, we're building an um, imaging center and a surgery center. Uh, so part of that coordination of care is I need um, I need a sedated dental appointment, but I also can't get an eye exam because I can't sit still long enough. I'm going in for my sedated dental. I can do my eye exam at the same time. So getting those um, those services all coordinated so that we're when we do have to sedate, which is not our first go-to, but when we do have to sedate, that we're getting as many services done as possible. Um, and our AAC <coughs> will work very similar. So they need to go into surgery, but they need an eye exam, they need a tooth pulled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've done podiatry and dental appointment um, coordination. Um, so podiatrist is working on the foot while the dentist is working on the Their family was so happy because um, no podiatrist really wanted to work, um, you know, with a without a general anesthesia, anesthesia, but they didn't want to do it in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just really meeting those families where they're at, um, whether it be in a community-based service, a medical or a therapy need. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're really excited and we look forward to expanding and you know seeing where we can, you know coordinate with what you guys are doing here because we're excited about what you guys are doing I'm locally yeah. it's amazing yes. yeah so thank you all for everything um yeah and just to kind of wrap up on a few points with that too um navigation itself in order to meet with the navigator or do a care plan and really identify what your needs may be that's going to be at no cost to our families um no, so oh, sorry. We, the navigator referred to like a case manager would that be yeah, that? a little higher level more okay. air traffic controller okay. but um if they were needing full-time case management support we would connect them with mm -hmm. the agency that could, that could provide that a little bit more intensively sure. um but with that we do take in your insurance or understand what that status is for our families upon um, meeting and doing that initial assessment um again no requirement in regard to insurance or household income or anything like that for us but we're just going to obtain that to understand it and then refer you as appropriate to those providers so out-of-pocket costs or insurance would still come into play for care um, as as it normally would in any doctor's visit but what makes that more unique though is knowing if you're getting referred to a MAC partner that there's been a vetting process in terms of the accessibility and the experience that that individual is going to have in that space so mm -hmm. dental is probably 80 percent of our members have been identified as needing dental care um, which is probably a no-brainer for a lot of us here but um, finding someone that's going to be able to be patient and literally sit on the floor to provide care yeah. for our members so is amazing. unique you know yeah. um, and that's really kind of what our our roles are uh, within the MAC is to help identify those partners statewide because we find a lot of individuals, our members are coming up from South Texas, San Juan area, Laredo, mm -hmm. McAllen, you know, uh, coming in, which we're so grateful for. But understanding, you know, what's happening locally is going to be critical for us. And yes. so that we can continue to work together to bridge that and help support y'all in, in yes. those transition periods, too. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry, is there an age group? There, we serve all ages. Okay. So um, you don't ever age out of navigation. Okay. Um, so we're hopeful that, you know, as long as you continue getting navigated and getting support from us, you're, you're going to be an ACT member. Um, we hope to be with you through all transitions, right? So if you're entering school or exiting school, trying to find employment, um, we partnered with United Healthcare, and we have a workforce inclusion network which focuses on employment services for members as well. So resume writing, job readiness, job skills training, all that good stuff. Uh, benefits counseling being a big one. A lot of our members have a lot of concern with benefits um, in terms of what they may be eligible for, so we have that on, uh, available on site as well. A couple other services we have legal on site, so um, we do we 
do a lot of um, guardianship. So mm -hmm. and starting those conversations early, you know, before they age out and become their own guardian and family doesn't realize that they're their own guardian. So um, that navigator can start having those conversations with the families, you know, when they're 13, 14, 15 years old, so that by the time they turn 18, they have that guardianship already in place. Um, they, that, so that's a big one for our legal team. Um, we, um, we have an amazing group called Practice Without Pressure. So Practice Without Pressure really is kind of what it sounds like. It's, um, I always say, coming from the healthcare world, I say it's a little bit of child life, it's a little bit of ABA, it's a little bit of play therapy all rolled into one, but it's, it's really giving those members <laughs> the autonomy um, to be a part and be an active um, you know, individual in their own healthcare. So um, they, they really focus on procedure-based. So if I know that I have a dental appointment coming up and I um, need some extra support in getting ready for that dental appointment, um, they will work with that member to get there. Um, you know, besides our workforce and inclusion network, we um, just opened our salon. So you want to talk a little bit? Yes. Morgan Salon on site. So we're offering manicures, pedicures, uh, basic nail care, and just haircuts and styling. But again, in a sensory environment, so really low, low fragrant like materials are used. We have uh, roll up seats, so anyone in an individual can recline back without having to transition. Um, they were doing a soft opening right now. So um, come January seventeenth. Or in San Antonio, come on up. Get your haircut. Um, you know, it'll be at fairly reasonable cost as well. But we do have a voucher program for any individual identified with a financial need. We can support them with that too. Um, we do have local transportation partnerships. We have recognized transportation is a huge barrier for a lot of our families. Um, the local uh, via transit is, uh, you know, a partner of ours as well. Um, as well as a few community-based partners, San Antonio Food Bank, ACOG, The Ark, Any Baby Can, um, Epilepsy Foundation, Community First Health Plans, um, San Antonio Fire to do that emergency preparedness that you were speaking on earlier. We have a great relationship with the local department there. So um, I see a question, sorry, I just saw yeah. one state uh, It says, what state funds are used to support Morgans mm -hmm. in San Antonio? Perhaps we yeah. can tap into those funds for you. <laughs> yeah, HHSC, yeah, is our um, so the, fun. Yeah, um, for that. So, I mean, they come out um, a few times a year just to, you know, review and assess and all that, but we have a really great relationship with them. And then as part of our, um, Kind of just evaluation side of it because we can sit here and talk about all the good things we're doing but who's to say um so, uh, san antonio is actually one of our partners and we're working with their evaluation and research coordinating center so they're kind of our third party um eyes on us and in, in, in review of all that so all of our feedback and assessments are all tracked and managed through them so that in another year's time, we'll have the data to show you know what yeah. we're actually doing. Are they at the table with these members of UT Health, our education center? Uh, no, no, that'd be a good resource yeah. to tap into mm -hmm. for sure. So all the services that you provide here and at the facility, amazing facility, they have to have a uh, payment source. The people that go there, the individuals. Some do. Um, some some fees or programs are offered at no cost or via sliding scale fee based on household income. That's all something, again, we help educate the families mm -hmm. on of, of understanding what that cost may look like associated with the program. But it's not nonprofit, for example, you don't provide any free services at all. Navigation to. services, the free at no cost service. The free, the navigation <laughs> services. Yeah, so understanding what resources may be available to them close to home, too, if they're coming from out of town or mm -hmm. even the south side of San Antonio. Why the heck would anyone drive to northeast side of yeah. San Antonio? Yeah. I guess you know um, so that's again why we're broadening our net you know we have about uh, nearly 10 I believe off-site partners um, yeah. around San Antonio as well but it's growing daily wow. um, so um, you know but again just trying to identify those resources that are happening um, it can't all happen right we only have so right. many square right. 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 Um so that's really what we're moving into now you all being part of HHSC you've got deliverables and all this good stuff that you've got to, sure right is. yeah this can hopefully serve as that demonstration of sure. what this could look like if we review a Mac or yeah, a yes. Mac Houston or a 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 Mac just that, and I know Erica and I, as uh, uh, with our UT partners from the Neurodevelopment Center, uh, took a site visit to San Antonio uh, to go see the Multi Assistance Center, and it was just. I, I, I cried. <laughs> I cried. And I think that you know, when you left, uh, 
eye opening for, for me was just the the amount of, like of resources needed. Like it's just so impressive to hear like the square footage, the amount of staff, the amount of navigators. Like we have one, which is Christine. <laughs> 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 we were touring the facility the level of detail like on the elevators or like the sound in the hallways like all of those things are considered um, so definitely uh, I told Kelly I'm like your operations goals I want to be you when I grow up because like everything is considered and it's very very beautiful so um, definitely encourage you guys to check it out when, when you guys are there um, I'm um, there often now, as I said, so I probably will go visit again. You know what I wanted to, I'm sorry, you know what I wanted to say is we had initially, back in the day, talked about us taking a trip out there, ask the committee, right? So we can bring that to the table. I mean, we pair away, get your day, whatever we need to do, and then schedule it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we'd love to do that. I mean, of course, everybody's getting away and writing these things. During that site visit, I know, uh, again, I, I was looking at all the ideas. It, going into one of the rooms, which was so amazing, it was uh, a real-life apartment. Mm -hmm. And that's what really amazed me, how they did the practice of uh, making your bed, cooking, doing things, and it being, you know, ADA accessible, right? Um, the other idea again don't reinvent the real Christy I was just thinking of ideas and we were talking about practice with no pressure we're like let's bring that to Laredo and that's what we did the next week you know, yeah. you know Christine who has yeah. that and it's a really neat room um, Aure siempre has that and they've got you know a place where they do their beds and they get the kitchen it's a really nice mm -hmm. the school yeah, locally the school district also has it at the church center the 18 plus program oh, yeah, they, they actually yeah. have a, a living facility yeah. that I mean you walk in and it looks like the house. Yeah. 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 The Rita College, the one South. Elsie does oh, that. Yeah. They have it, but they closed down the occupational therapy. Oh, yes. Yes. So all that area, there's, a, there's an actual apartment and kitchen and laundromat, everything. Um, yeah. so yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. open there as well. So there's, I think there's a lot to be able to, again, getting getting the resources and yeah. knowing what's there and then how it's utilized because a lot of the so ideas have healthy LC for a macro <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just had an idea. I think that's what she was hinting. <laughs> or smart lady. <laughs> yeah. Or um, with the Cabo Rehabilitation Center is also looking into uh, a, a, a campaign is coming up about we need a new building. We are since <laughs> <laughs> I feel and uh, we need to. We're growing, expanding. The need is there, and we used to have a, an apartment and uh, everything there for the patients that need this. Especially mm -hmm. now, our community is growing, and so is the need. And so we are looking into that, and I'll be interested in talking to you all about. Yeah. Jackie being modest, Jackie is the director of the program at the Ruby County. It is a facility that services the community and in such an amazing way. I, I know a lot of individuals that have attended that facility and they could have had choices of going elsewhere, mm -hmm. but they chose not to. Uh, yes. and resources are limited. That is very expensive here. It's, it's one of those things is, it's about people shaking the foundation so mm -hmm. when something else happens. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, partnerships are always good and growing with that. But yeah, she she she's she's the vision. She's the right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she could use yeah. the help. <laughs> So when we're first about to get to this tour, who do we reach out to? To myself. Uh, and Christine I would be happy okay. to help and see and kind of coordinate with everyone and see when it's a good time. I know our program um, from uh, Children and Middle Social Health Needs, our state really encourages us to go once a year. I know we went this past year, so we're going to make a, another trip, but we're happy to see how we can coordinate. Yeah. Any BRC members that would be willing or wanting to go? I mean, I hope. I mean, I, I'm on. And we certainly have some property there to expand. <laughs> 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 
up upstairs or on the sides we have some property there so we're looking at all the possibilities but we really would like to uh, offer and expand for the community here in the radio nice. we offer physical occupational speech therapy transportation we're actually currently hopefully on friday we have with a health department uh erica um with uh talking about transportation it's a a collaboration with the Methodist Hospital to provide services just like navigation that these individuals when they go to our, our uh, agency what they say is they're having to wait such a long time to get their referrals yeah. or people don't really listen to them or they want transportation but they don't have it at the right time so with us our collaboration is going to be through transportation and case management so that they can not only say, well, you're going to be referred here, but actually be advocating for them and making sure that those people are getting the information that they need so they can get the medical services. So we provide, we're the only ones really that provide transportation for yeah. our patients. And we do well, but with the rate of growing because we provide to the rural areas like El Centro, Rio Bravo. And with the traffic being what it is right now, um, we are glad that City of Laredo has provided uh, through grants uh, two amazing um, ADA approved vehicles where we can bring in those uh, individuals that need the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And we're not get them there. Yeah. How do you get them there? They really need it. And so we're the only really nonprofit outpatient facility that provides this feature now in a way, thanks to the community support. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks to you for fighting. Mm -hmm. But if you never have no money, you're gonna give me money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Give me the money. I know. <laughs> There's a lot of going on, but um, yes, definitely, I would like to to meet with you and see how they can work together. Absolutely. Yeah, the transportation issues and a big problem. Yeah, yes, yes. And and the, the breakdowns are like extraordinarily expensive yes because okay, like here in Laredo you need to bring somebody from San Antonio to fix your yes. ears mm -hmm. when it happen so that's true mm -hmm. so yeah it's good that you were you were given two two vans two vans we have uh, we have two mm -hmm. more piece of nation two vans and they're uh, excellent and they're they're beautiful vans I'm sure you're seeing them out there and the, the the patients just love to be able to go in there and I mean we have amazing staff and so the drivers of course also but some of the some of the complaints or concerns of some of those patients that don't have with our transportation is if it does a wonderful job but you know they they do have to wait sometimes two hours mm -hmm. sometimes even two and a half and you have these patients that have diabetes or they need their medication or they need to have you know so we usually keep some food and things in there in case they need mm -hmm. to have that before you know to start feeling ill but hopefully we can get something done with this on friday we'll be able to get an answer whether we are approved for that um correct that will help us provide more of that transportation, not awesome. just to our patients, but to the community. Mm -hmm. Your funky guy that you have there that haven't gone to see? Which one? Oh, the director. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're the only ones we, we uh, made history here in the red where we unveiled a um, um, root, uh, ceiling uh, system technology that is allows patients that ha have had um, that need to uh, start their therapy earlier, so we, there's earlier intervention uh, to where they, a lot of the patients that go there, if they have a stroke, especially the COVID recovered patients mm -hmm. that were left with so many disabilities, some of them uh, were able to recover fully, others were left with some um, um, special needs now that they have to adapt and use special adapt, uh, adaptive equipment. But we help them where they can actually feel confident and not because one of their main concerns is the fear of falling again and hurting themselves. So this robotic system actually uh, is a, a computerized system where they, we put everything in the information of the system so they know their way, they know uh, if, if they're gonna fall, they can even practice in falling and they don't really fall, but that's, they, they feel confident so they can, you know, do more yeah. other than when they're limited because they're fear of falling. Sure. So you have to go and see this better. We're the only ones that have it in all of South Texas. It was through a grant from Webb County. Uh, we have another uh, piece of equipment. It's called the um, Ultra Ultra G Gravity uh, Treadmill, which is aquatic therapy without the water. We're also the ones that only ones that have it in all of South Texas. So we're a nonprofit, but the notion out there that we we have really the best of the art equipment and the best staff. So yes, um, oh, we have a Yes, please. Well, we'll we'll get the communication. <laughs> Are there any other questions on Morgan's Mac that we can clear up for you? I was fast and furious. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Kelly. Thank you so much for making a trip. No problem. We appreciate, I, I we appreciate the information. Mm
We appreciate everything that you guys are doing for you know the special needs community and you know just really putting your city you know and making this a priority in your city um, you know because most cities aren't doing this so we really do appreciate you know y'all y'all making this a priority and any way we can partner with you guys in the future or you know just come by and, and you know, either come to us or us come to you. Let us know. We'll be glad to help. We'll make arrangements. We take one of our vans. There you go. That's the way to go. No, we're not taking them. We're not taking them. We're not taking them. Yes, we do the night to shine which you guys do also as well oh. and uh, we are expecting a lot of participants um, right. last year we had a lot of participants that showed up who wanted to be there, but I mean, the fear of COVID still was there, so I think this year is going to be better. But it wasn't any different in the end, I can tell you. We we spared nothing from what we had, and so this year we're expecting the same. So uh, please, please don't tell me I can't because you tell me to plan, and I'm telling you it's the Friday before Valentine's Day. <laughs> okay. We need as many people as we need to, to just uh, uh, provide that one-to-one -one service, that uh, detailed service for, for our customers and the people who show up that day. Thank you, we'll all be uh, an additional update, I did want to um, thank Dr. Chamberlain uh, for his leadership and participation in the project leadership for tech, with Texas Tech and National Leadership Consortium for Intellectual Disabilities. We did a week-long training, almost a week, um, at Texas Tech. Um, we The work is not done. We have a project mm -hmm. we will present in April, and that's um, really um, taking a hard look at our operations um, and what we can improve on to be more inclusive within the health department and setting us up as um, pretty much you know best practices for the rest of the city of Laredo or other agencies that are looking to do the same so we're very excited for that initiative mm -hmm. um, got a lot of good information um, we, they surveyed our style of learning and leadership um, so we came back with a lot of tidbits a lot of great information I don't know if Dr. Chairman wants to add anything but um, just wanted to give you an update on that. I'll just add on a little bit more. It was um, very um, eye-opening to learn the history regarding IDD in our country, um, which touched me at my core and something that I would want us to, um, or to challenge us here at this Blue Ribbon Committee for persons with disabilities is to actually have persons PLE here at this table. Um, persons with lived experience are just that, persons with lived experience. and I. Appreciate every one of you all here as the advocates for those persons, but those persons have voices too, mm -hmm. and they do need to be reflective here at this table. So that was my piece to bring back and make sure that we do bring in those persons and that they are sitting here at this table as they are driving the, the transformative, disruptive change that this community does need, as many communities need that as well. But here, what I gathered from the leadership challenge is that we are doing amazing things as a community, and we are taught to say, you are too kind. But in those moments, we needed to own it and say thank you, because we are. So thank you all. Thank you. So I've got an announcement, um, long and coming, and I was sharing with the ladies here. Um, we will be hosting Emma Faye Rudkin with the Aid the Silent pop-up tent at the hospital on Saturday. We've got 15 youth that are gonna get hearing aids. Yay! So it's finally happening, and I'm so happy that we're giving back and helping people, absolutely. So we'll be there all day, eight to five. When was this exactly? Saturday the 18th. Mm -hmm. Yes. I also wanted to make an announcement. I know I should have done my prayer back So during our trip to Lubbock, uh, I did have a scheduled meeting to meet with the Texas Council of Developmental Disabilities to present um, what, how our community looks as uh, when it comes to dental services, inclusive dental services. So uh, we picked up some reports from the state. We are very medically underserved in that area for providers for dentists. Um, dentists in the ratio, but also having the practices of being able to administer inclusive services. 
Um, so during the presentation, um, we decided to go to the route of being able to throw a sales pitch to whoever was at the state meeting to see who can partner with us, because we're eager to partner, to host workshops and trainings for our professionals and educator families to give them empower, to, to be more empowered in their own health care, right, or in their, in their own dental care. Um, but and also see yes. yes. So we're having uh, some workshops that are busy. We're having <laughs> some <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, We are having some workshops that are very, um, like, a, uh, a very short notice, but it's tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow today and, and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow. So today we're going to um, have the advocacy portion of the uh, education. So we have Dr. Frey and Dr. Fleming that will be coming down. The one thing I wanted to mention with Dr. Fleming, he is the um, he is the one that spearheads the methods and strategies of teachings in the American Academy of Dental in Dentistry. Um, so uh, we're going to be having his uh, methods and tools coming down. Uh, so that will be hosted on tomorrow for our healthcare professionals. So they are requesting that if there's any OTPT speech as well as um, any healthcare professionals that are in the room to come in and learn uh, uh, on the strategies and what new uh, methods are coming out so that they're uh, more aware of the education. Please help us spread the word. We definitely want um, some engagement from our community. We have identified that as a need. You know, we want uh, providers to feel empowered with this information. And um, like Christine said, we want to continue those partnerships. So showing you know our presence in, in these activities would only you know increase that moment. So this so is today. Oh, I'm sorry. Today from what time? What time? So today will be uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And tomorrow. Tomorrow will be from 11 to 12. Is there any more you could send? Yes. 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 Um, okay. I, I am uh, letting uh, families know that the advocacy portion, because it's advocates and families, um, those that have in, uh, children or young adults or even adults that have uh, special health care needs, we're providing them a $50 gift card for HEB this round. So mm -hmm. the state did approve that for this round, so families are left with that incentive as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We'll share the flyer yeah, and yeah. all our social media. Yeah, get the word out. I mean, it's a bit late, but we'll see. It'll a very quick turnaround. Yeah. And rather than saying, like, no, like with the holidays yeah. coming up and everything, we're just okay, let's let's do it. And we'll just engage our beautiful partners that are always willing to you know, work with us to get that participation going. Sure. So thank you. I have one more comment and request. You let us talk, we will talk forever. <laughs> Comments. I just want to say thank you to the chair for bringing this idea for us to go out and to look for this organization that might be doing some type of extrapolation DNA amplification and then ultimately testing the DNA for a specific gene. This is exactly what we would want from the committee to be able to bring us topics such as these so we can come back and do this type of research and then bring those persons to the table, such as Matt. So thank you all for being here. So if I could kindly ask the committee as you just presented right now for some something for, for us to go back and look for and bring it to the table and each one of you all as well. Anything that's related to disabilities, we want to make sure that we're also highlighting the initiatives that potentially constituents are bringing to you all and then we're also researching it and bringing it to this forum. And actually, if I may, uh, right now you were talking about also um, having um, individuals with disabilities participate more in the meetings. I actually have a young lady, a student that is deaf blind, and she's interested. Her goal is to ultimately, we're already talking about her educational goal and, you know, employment, and she hopes to become a lawyer to advocate for people with disabilities. So she was asking me, hey, Ms. Honey, can I go in, like, into a court case? And I was like, okay. You know, right? <laughs> 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 we have a career day as a senior where they can bring in lawyers. We do go. I remember back in the day, yeah, my yeah. career day, I was able because back in the day I wanted to become an architect. So <laughs> I was able to become a global architect. Um, so I was like giving her ideas. And she said, and I want to attend uh, the council meetings. She was like, but how do I go about that? Because I need an interpreter. So I was kind of also as yeah. well. But. Um, this would be also maybe a, um, a first step to maybe inviting her to come into the Blue Ribbon Committee. And that, and that could be yeah, another yeah, 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 yeah. that they need interpreters for council meetings. I have a question 
the Mr. Castillo's house, if they were going to be part number 10, right, would they be invited as guests, or would they be invited to the open meeting? But she can stay as long as she would be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Perry. Just so we understand. Thank you for that. Yes, but she can attend as a non-member. I think she wants to start having a word and speaking yeah. about um, specifically yeah. deaf blindness, which yeah. 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 of course it's a very, very small population, mm -hmm. but if we're having her, and I remember in a meeting with one of her, of her teachers, he's like, okay, how about these good students? Do we make them? But then they leave that little and they don't come back, so I hope you come back to us, because mm -hmm. that's what we need. We need advocates here in, in, in Laredo, and that's, you know, ultimately. Please ask her to join us at the next meeting, mm -hmm. if she's yeah. able, of course, to school out. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for what you said. I know that everybody, this group has been together for quite a number of years. Yes. For perpetual. We come for that free lunch. Thank you. Thank you all. No, thank you. Thank you. And Christine, well, Christine, we wouldn't have a meeting. <laughs> yeah, we have you all. That's right. We're bringing those ideas. Okay, so maybe we can move on. Yes. So, um, anyone, anyone want to move to adjourn? I'll motion. I need a second. A second. Okay, second. We have adjournment. Thank you. 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 Thank you.